So welcome to another episode of the State of Security series. Uh, today, we are joined by Tanya Jenka. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, Joe. Uh, so, Tanya, I'd love it if we could start uh, with, with two things. One, just tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do. And also, I'd love to hear, hear more about your book, Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. OK. So um, I am someone who used to be a software developer who discovered application security and got really excited about it and who discovered that if you speak at a conference, you get in for free. <laughs> and so <laughs> I started applying at like every conference that I wanted to try to get a ticket to. And then I started speaking more and more. Um, and then now I run a training company where I train people how to write secure software and how to build application security programs. And that is where this came in. I So I, I wrote a book because it turns out I love writing. I I wrote code for like 17 years. You'd think that I would know that I like writing, but it didn't occur to me until I, someone at work dared me to write a blog. And he said, I, I bet if you write a blog once a week for three months that you'll get 40 regular readers. And I was like, no way. Well, yeah, he was, he was right. Um, and then I, yeah, and then I wanted to basically Someone asked if I wanted to write a book, and I was like, me? <laughs> um, but it turns out that anyone can write a book if they want to. Um, yeah, and I, I spent a year researching it and then another year writing it. Well, actually, more like four or five months writing it, and then six or eight months arguing with my technical editors <laughs> who are super-duper experts and totally amazing and brilliant, and they're like, well, this is slightly ambiguous. Well, did you think of this? I'm like, right. Um, but yeah, I wrote a book because I want the world to be more secure, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And that is great motivation to write a book, definitely. Um, no, that, that's great. I know it's, it's a huge book. It's a very popular book. I see a lot of people sharing how much they've enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's on my reading list. I've not read it yet, uh, but I'm really excited to read it. So thank you for sharing that, Tanya. Um, you. you mentioned um, you started off as a, as a software engineer. Um, you know, can you tell me a little bit about your path into cybersecurity specifically, uh, you know, when was the moment you knew you were interested in cybersecurity? So I, I have the weirdest path into cybersecurity because I was a software developer and I got hired um, by the Department of Justice uh, in Canada in 2008. And then I, they kind of did this job switcheroo thing on me and threw me into security and anti-terrorism stuff. And I really didn't like it at all. <laughs> It was a really bad experience. Um, terrorism is very scary. Obviously, I can't give you details, but it was like, oh, this is really awful. I don't like this at all. And all the security people are really mean to me all the time. So I thought I didn't like security at all. I went back to software development after a year. And then um, and then fast forward many years later, and I met someone who was a penetration tester. And he was in and he would do pen testing, and he's just like this cool guy, and he's like, you should work in security. And I was like, no, security's lame. <laughs> um, but then he was in a band, and I was in a band. And one day I went up to him and I said, so my band wrote this song called Mandatory Dance Party, and I want to write a mobile app where if two people have the mobile app, it'll just start going beep, 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 beep. And then they know each other, both have the app, like they're strangers in the grocery store, and then it plays the song, and then they have to have a dance party. And then however much the phone moves, that person wins. And he's like, I'm in. <laughs> and then we became friends. And then he spent a year and a half convincing me to join the security field and introducing me to lots of cool people. And then I joined the OWASP chapter. And I just I completely fell in love with OWASP and the community and all the amazing projects and people. And then it was too late for me. <laughs> and, then I, and then I became a penetration tester for like around two years, but then I discovered application security. So sort of that role between the devs and the security team, like you help the devs, you teach them, you still get to do testing, but you do like code review and it, building cool DevOps pipelines and stuff like that. And I was like, yes, yes, that's what I want. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> so I have the weirdest way ever into security probably. <laughs> I, I've spoken to a lot of people about their passing to security, and I've heard some great stories, but yours is definitely right up there with one of the best I've heard. That was that was great to hear. Good insight. Thank you. Uh, okay, so 
you know, the last year or so has been very difficult for a lot of people. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And when this first started happened, companies really were scrambling um, to, to support a virtual workforce. And, you know, what advice would you share to those companies or, or those people in charge today when they're looking to secure a remote workforce? Well, I would say, so there's some really obvious best practices that everyone should do. Like, for instance, ensuring you have good web filtering, email filtering, you know, set it up so when your employees join your network, they're using a secure device that's, that's your device, not their home device, and that you've you know, taught them to not go on safe sites on the internet, et cetera. Um, get them to turn on multi-factor authentication, get them to ensure that other people aren't using that device. Um, so like all of the things that would normally happen with work from home, if that makes sense. But I would say another couple of huge things are explaining that phishing people, like the malicious actors phishing people um, are definitely totally on to the fact that all of us want a vaccine right now. And if you receive an email about that, there's a good chance that it's not legit and kind of give them heads up to trends in that area. And then also check in with your employees because lots of them are depressed. Lots of them feel lost. Lots of them are super frustrated. Lots of them have children at home that try to kind of crawl on them the whole time that they're trying to work and it's really hard to stay focused. And I, I would say one of the biggest issues is just like employees not knowing when to stop working, uh, employees having problems motivating themselves where they just don't want to work at all because they're at home and they're like, oh, but my TV's here and like my yoga studio and, and my in my case, my farm is there and that needs weeding. And it's easy to get distracted because all your cool stuff is where you live. <laughs> um, so like, although it might not seem like a security issue, if you have employees that are really not motivated, they're less likely to take those extra security precautions. Yeah, mm -hmm. and specifically sensitive data at home, if there's other adults there, um, how to protect that. I heard someone saying the other day, oh, well, you know, my wife works from home too. And like, yeah, she hears only my half of all the video calls. And it's like, you're working on a really sensitive project. And that person definitely shouldn't be hearing like the details of that. So I guess like it's the stuff that's obvious and then just touching or having touch points with them significantly more often than you would and like having regular meetings. I've had my own employees be like, we don't need a meeting, blah, blah, blah. And then we don't have a meeting and then the thing doesn't get done. And I'm like, so can we have those meetings? Like, and it's it's not that they, they don't want to, it's just that it's kind of, it's easier to get off track when you're in your own home. It really is. I know. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. guilty too. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think I think that communication part is really important because there are both ends of the spectrum where people struggle with that motivation, but also knowing when to stop. You know, our work and, and life should be separate. You know, there's no reason why you can't have one and the other like really close side by side, but you have to know when to switch off. And I think that is a real challenge for people. Um, you know, securing a remote workforce because people then that's when issues start to happen, problem mistakes happen because people are tired or, you know, like you say, they've got children and they let their children use their device and, and things like that. And that's how problems start. And I guess that kind of leads on to the next question as well, because, you know, people were forced to work remote. Um, and I think a lot of people do like it. Um, there are some positives, there are some negatives. Um, but I don't think we're ever going to go back to a complete office environment. I think there will be this, this hybrid virtual workforce moving forward. Mm -hmm. So how will, how will security programs be impacted moving forward? How can companies you know, build on existing programs moving forward? Oh, I think that they're going to have to be better at checking in. They're going to have to be better at educating the employees. They're going to have to be like, I, so I don't, endorse at all, like um, spying on employees. I've heard of some places where they're insisting everyone's cameras on during every Zoom meeting so they can make sure they're paying attention. And I think that's really gross. I do think though that there is going to have to be stuff like um, MDM, like where, you know, like Microsoft Intune, where it verifies that you actually have the antivirus on, it verifies that you're using the VPN, um, not spying on what you're doing, but making sure that you're actually following the security protocols that are agreed upon, like that you don't have 25 different fingers that can unlock your phone because we only have 10. Um, do you know what I mean? Like 
those sorts of technical verifications to make sure that the security controls are in fact being used. I think that we're gonna have to be able to automate a lot more of that as well. Um, I think that a lot of security teams are, are feeling overwhelmed and I think they're gonna have to get a little bit more creative with the way that they engage employees so that the employees learn and that the employees are on board with their policies. Right. Uh, I, I've seen, yeah, um, I just started giving this new conference talk called Building Security Champions. And like this big part is just like how to engage people and get them actually listening. Because an employee received, like when I worked at Microsoft or when I worked in the Canadian government, you get so many emails. You get so many emails and they're all these newsletters and they're super boring. <laughs> and it's not that the person writing isn't trying, but if you're the security team and you're trying to cut through all of the emails that are for work, all the other newsletters that they're on because of their job, and then you're like, please, there's this new policy, I really need you to do it. You're gonna have to try to be a bit more creative in engaging people and getting them to listen and actually think before whether they click that link or before they allow their kid to use the computer to play whatever game. And like, if we can clearly explain the risk without scaring the pants off them um, so that they're terrified all the time or without boring them to absolute tears, like that middle line between those two, um, I think that that could go really well because before the security team could come in person and talk to you, there would be things, Quite frankly, like when you have a lunch and learn in person and you can lure people in with hot, delicious, smelling pizza, that's a in person that you can do over the computer. I have seen, uh, I'm part of like this women executive um, thing where uh, they're training us in special whatevers. And one week the speaker actually, so I'm in Canada, but the other speakers or the other executives are all in the United States and Silicon Valley, most of them. And so they actually shipped a bottle of wine and chocolate to all of these high powered executive women um, that were all in Silicon Valley to like have them show up to their training. And I was like, <laughs> no, that's the best I've ever seen for trying to get people engaged. <laughs> There's definitely a way to get people involved, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that that point is is massive because people, you know, there's there's so much going on now, and to have people engaged in a security program is so important because, as you alluded to in the, the, the previous question, yeah, things like phishing threats are they're being aligned to remote workers, people working at home. That's only going to continue to evolve. So people have to be ready. They, they have to be aware. And yeah, that is on the security teams to to help implement that. But it is going to be a challenge moving forward, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, switching away from the, the remote working side of things uh, and looking at security and compliance, um, you know, those two words are, are often said in the same breath, but actually, you know, security and compliance are quite different things. But in your opinion, how can security and compliance teams actually work together to create a, a winning alliance? Um, so let's briefly explain the difference. So compliance is making sure that you are in line with a policy. Right? And sometimes it's a checklist, sometimes you can automate it, but it's making sure that you are meeting policy. I just want to make sure we have the same definition. And then security is making sure that things are hardened, that things are safe, that, that you can't force a system to do things that it should not do, right? And so, so I, like you may know, I'm like obsessed with DevOps and DevSecOps and part of the beauty of DevSecOps or DevOps is that, so you use this pipeline software to release your code. And the first thing you do is just figure out, does my code compile? Awesome. Then it's like, okay, let's put it in this thing and see if it can compile it. It does, great. Now let's see if I can get it to deploy to like a server where it could live. It does, awesome. And so you just press a button and it's doing these things now, great. You can add compliance checks in there for the security policy. So does it, you know, did I do the proper scan that I'm supposed to? Yes, did I pass it? Yes, great, continue on with your pipeline. Did I fail? Oh darn, I did. It says that there's, you know, this problem with this. Okay, back to the drawing board, fix that thing. Go through the cycle again. And so the automation of compliance is from a DevOps and like effectiveness, efficiency perspective, which is what most software engineers dream of all the time. I do. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's like, it's really beautiful. And now with people moving to the cloud, 
there's all these super cool compliance checks that can be automated as well. So it's running scans and verifying things. It's like, Tanya, you don't have multi-factor authentication on your database owner account? <gasps> and Zoe will tell you the things that you're doing that aren't in line with the policy and specifically the, the security policy. I know like we want to do compliance with all the other policies too, but I'm less excited about those. I want code quality and security. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I think that with automation and with using like specifically like DevOps ways of developing software and with using cloud for automation, it's a lot harder to do on premises, like in your own data center, but there are, um, a bunch of cool companies out of Israel that are working on automating all of the different things within uh, AWS, and then Microsoft sort of trying to do their own within Azure. And it's pretty cool to be able to like click a button and say, so how close am I to meeting these sys benchmarks? Or how close am I to ISO 27001? And it can't check everything, but it can check a lot. And it will tattletale on people that turn things off. And I really like that because as a security person, <laughs> yeah. I have caught a lot of devs doing things where I'm like, we need to have a talk. And they're like, oh, she busted me. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> there's no pizza for you at the next lunch and lunch. You have to just smell how delicious it is. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> but no, you're exactly right. You know, the DevOps is a great example where, you know, the DevOps methodology is, you know, much further ahead than the other methodologies and to have security and compliance aligned together and almost to help each other because sometimes security can be deemed to slow things down. It shouldn't be like that, uh, which is always going to be a challenge. And and I guess that's, you know, what you do, Tanya. You help people acknowledge that and, and keep moving forward. So, no, good answer. Oh, thank you. It does take time to set up. It does. But once you have it, it's beautiful. <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> Good, no, I like it. Sounds good. Okay, so um, based on your recent experiences and your insights, how are, how are cyber attacks actually evolving at the moment? How are they changing? And in your opinion, what are the biggest threats that companies need to focus on right now? So I know that in general, um, there's just way more phishing attacks and way more ransomware attacks. And that those are unfortunately working really well against companies. So. Um, specifically for ransomware, backups, and practicing your rollbacks regularly. I have seen companies get hit by ransomware and they're like, joke's on you, like we're only gonna lose two hours work because we have practiced our rollbacks. Um, I don't see a purpose of bothering to employ a bunch of people doing backups if you've never practiced your rollbacks or you don't know how to access your backups. Um, I worked at a place once and they said, yeah, it's just gonna take us a few months to roll that back. Like we've why do you even work here? Like, <laughs> we don't need you if we can't access, like, and so we all just lost three days of work and there were 2,000 of us. That's wow. grossly wow. expensive. Yeah, and I mean, and then it scares the employees as well. But in application security or software security, lately there have been some fairly complicated and advanced attacks in regard to supply chain. So software supply chain, so infecting, one thing that the, another thing depends on and another thing depends on that and you used your app, like you use this in your app and you have no idea that it chains down into all these other places. And uh, for a long time, I have been suggesting that we you know, analyze the security of the components we use in our code. And so I'm like this percent happy that finally clients and everyone are listening to the fact that I want us to pay attention to that risk that we accept. but. I'm like mostly just sad that um, there's been really successful attacks in that area. And so I'm hoping that this will mean specifically people building software are going to start checking all the dependencies they're using, right? Like you could check it manually. Like, I mean, if you're a giant company like IBM, you can actually, from what I understand, they actually review every single dependency themselves for security. And like, that's amazing. But for the average company that doesn't have a million people working for them, um, you can use software composition analysis tools. You can just like look at the component and be like, is this supported by one dude who hasn't made updates in a year? Don't install that. Don't install mm -hmm. that. Or is it um, a framework that's you know created by a company that's 
you know, regularly supported that has many contributors. Um, like, look at if, uh, you know, it recently switched hands, look at, you know, how often it's updated, look at, like, look it up in the CVE database to see if it's listed there. Um, always use the absolute newest version of whatever it is you're using for the first time and, like, keep updating those things. But I feel like, Unfortunately, Solar Winds has like rung that bell really, really. Like, it's fortunate for me who's been trying to get everyone to do it. I'm sad that that's the way it happened, but they really rang the bell quite loudly. And so I could get more clients to do a better job of um, making sure their components are safe, but it's still, uh, it's still a battle. We'll put it like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess having things like Solar Winds is, you know, it's, it's a horrific event, but actually things like that can be used to emphasize the need for proper supply chain security. Um, you know, and you know, you mentioned ransomware there, and obviously supply chain security, you know, people, criminals are creative. Um, and you know, if you put a block in there and you think that's enough, it's not because they're gonna get creative and they're gonna find a way to, to overcome it, go around it, under it, whatever it may be. So it is important to make sure we cover all those areas. And I think, yeah, you're really, you know, hitting the nail on the head when you said you know, about supply chain management and supply chain security. So, no, interesting insight. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, a couple more questions. So, um, one of the biggest issues that a lot of people have in security, um, especially CISOs, is how do they actually communicate uh, maybe a return on investment uh, to the stakeholders within the organization? How, how do CISOs get buy-in for, for new products, technology, people, whatever it may be, um, yeah, share, share some insights on that for me, please. So I actually um, am also giving another new talk this year called Metrics That Matter, Security Metrics That Matter, because I'm obsessed with gathering metrics and data. And so um, I, when I started my first application security program, I literally just took all of the results from our security incidents from the previous three months and said, you know, 26% were caused by insecure software and they're all super things but we had no application security program whatsoever they the devs had no support no guidance no advice and so i explained to them so my salary cost this much there's five months left on my contract because i had completed um the really so they they hired me for a few things and i'd actually completed all of it um and so there was five months left in my two-year contract which is awesome and so i said so you, you technically have to keep me because we're already signed and you like you could have me doing boring things or I could launch this program but keep doing like the operational stuff and it will just cost money you that's already sunk right and um and like this is how much those incidents cost us and it costs more than my salary for those five months and I don't need to buy any tools because I've you know picked a bunch of free tools that we can start with can I do it and when they saw well they're you know like I could easily have prevented all of those incidents. Like they were all really obvious things that we would find. They like the three executives just looked at each other. They're like, make it so just on the spot. Whoa. Um, so if you can gather how much, <laughs> how much you're spending on security incidents, um, how much it costs to go back when you find a bug later. Um, so there's this, um, I have this slide uh, that's in one of my talks, and it's from research from the Ponemon Institute, but there's all sorts of research all over the place of the later you fix a bug, the more it costs. So if you find it, you know, during the design phase, you realize there's a design flaw from a security perspective, you fix it then versus the end, it costs, there's a, there's a really big difference, let's say, it's exponential. And so you could also show that. So if we did threat modeling, if we did this, if we did that, for every bug we find, then and fix it then we're saving like approximately a thousand bucks like it's it's really amazing and so if if you're willing to gather those metrics which takes time um but i actually like love data so for me it's a pleasure but i know for that not everyone loves data um but yeah like if you can for instance like get all of those um like all the scans that you do all the pen test results and everything into excel or even better into a vulnerability management system. And then like just crunch the numbers and like show the trends and say, so like we've been finding bugs at this phase of the system development lifecycle, like pen testing right at the end, the pen tester costs 25K. And then, you know, we found like five critical bugs. 
if, if we had instead, you know, done a threat model for one hour, plus, um, you know, given them like a SAS code review tool checking for, you know, these five common things, and then we did a DASP scan on it, we could have found basically everything the pen tester found, right? Like there, there's layers to it. And um, so I tend to do things like that. And also like mm -hmm. we had this many security incidents, now we're having this many, or before we were having them and we didn't know and they were just like bleeding out in this awful way. Now we're catching them and we're stopping them. Um, so I try really hard to report regularly to bosses because I like to think of it as like advertising for them to continue keeping me employed. Um, and so I'll be like, look what I've done. And they're just like, thank you, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a kid, mom, mom, look at me, but it's, that's just my personality. Um, but when you do that and you show them like, this is your investment, this is you like getting return on your investment. It, it really helps when you ask for a tool or a thing that you want. Yeah, definitely. I, I think metrics matter so much. And I think that is a huge challenge for a lot of people or a lot of companies to have the resources to invest the time to prove the metrics, you know, to prove what works, you know, the examples you've just given there are, are great examples. Um, and that is a challenge, but if you can do it, and I think the advice you've just given there is is really, really strong, um, you know, that is obviously going to help for security leaders to get that buy-in, to, to deploy the toys, they, tools they need to keep moving forward, to keep the company secure. And, and I think sadly as well, you know, people maybe look at competitors uh, and, they, you know, go back to the solar winds incident, you can use things like that in a way to put, almost justify those investments as well, because you don't want to be that next company that could be, you know, front page of the paper or, or on the news, whatever it may be. So there are some some different tactics as well, but I I really like the metrics one. That's a big a big one for me too. Thank you. I feel like the rest of the security industry is already scaring people's pants off, so I don't have to press the scary button if that makes sense. I feel like that mm -hmm. button's been pressed enough by many marketing teams out there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, and that kind of leads on to the last question. Um, going back to security programs. So, you know, it sounds like you've worked with lots of different companies and lots of different projects. So when you're going into a, a new company or, um, you know, sorry, existing company, but looking for to build a new security program or maybe to rejuvenate uh, an existing program, what are the, the three or four areas that you would tell organizations to really focus on? So I always focus on application security and software security because that is my jam. Um, uh -huh. So do you want me to answer that based on my niche or just in general? Because um, in general, I mean, uh -huh. in general, phishing and email filtering and making sure every single employee is using a unique password, they're saving it in a password manager and they're turning on multi-factor authentication on anything that is even remotely important and then classifying and labeling all your data. Like, mm -hmm. just do that. But for apps, <laughs> I, I feel like every company that makes custom software needs an application security program. And like, that's what I teach at the academy. We like build your program with you. I believe that um, just talking to devs, figuring out like what your system development life cycle works like so are you doing agile are you doing waterfall are you doing devops and then figuring out where you can weave security throughout it with the least amount of friction right so there are always places where you could drop little things in and help improve the security and then educating your devs like showing them you know the solar winds thing but here's how we could have prevented that like here's how we manage our keys in a secret management system so that no one would be able to steal our secret key and no one would be able to sign code as though they were our, were us. Like that's terrifying, right? And this is why mm -hmm. I want you to use the secret manager that my team just bought for you, right? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in like supporting the devs and making secure software rather than coming in and whacking them with sticks. And um, yeah. yeah, so, I would say any company, if you have a whole bunch of software developers under you, you should have some sort of thing to support them in making sure that they create more secure software. And sometimes it doesn't need to be expensive necessarily. Depends on what level you're at. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that really emphasizes the point that you know humans are the strongest defense 
in terms of security. You know, a lot of people will say that they are the weak point or the weak link, which is wrong. If you empower them and give them the tools that they need or the guidance or the program, they will be yeah. your strongest ally. So I, I think that really emphasizes that, that, you know, that point you've just discussed there. 100%, Joe. Okay, great. No, I really appreciate the response to those questions. Um, there's now just some rapid fire questions. So these are quite short to the point. I don't want you to think about them okay. too hard. Um, okay. So I'll start at the top. So the first one is, uh, what cybersecurity newsletter do you read on a regular basis? Too long didn't read SEC. TLDR okay. SEC. <laughs> okay, no, I've not heard of that it's one. I'll have to check that out. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, good insight. Okay, what one cybersecurity account should everyone be following on Twitter? Mine? <laughs> and, and what's yeah, your handle, Tanya? Oh, she hacks purple. Perfect. Yeah. And I, if you could I, if you could nominate one other person. There's so many good ones. If you want to see lots and lots of positive things about women, follow WOSEC tweets. It's just all cool stuff that women in cyber are doing and like just Lots of quotes and retweets of tons of really kick-ass ladies. So I follow awesome. that one. <laughs> great choice. Both great choices. Um, in terms of data breaches, what was the one, in your opinion, um, that made the world sit up and pay attention to cybersecurity? Oh, that's really hard. Um, I would say that uh, Equifax, for for general, um, but I would say in Canada, Life Labs, it made me sit up uh, and pay attention. So it's um, all of the tests, like health tests that everyone in Canada has had. Uh, most of them were leaked onto the internet. Yeah, so that's particularly terrifying. And then solar winds more recently. So I guess I answered three, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. And you, no, you're, you're exactly right. It's those ones that really impact us or people we know uh, that we can really relate to. So yeah, I mean, for us, uh, I'm based in Europe and WannaCry was massive. Um, yeah, I've got family that worked in the National Health Service and they were saying this has all gone down and that es escalated and, and that was a real big one over here as well. So there's so many of them now, it's hard to just pick one, isn't it? Yeah, that makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not good, it's not good. Um, okay, there's lots of uh, random words uh, and phrases that are always used within the industry, but in your opinion, what's the most misused cybersecurity term out there? Um, misused? Oh, um, gosh, I'm ha DevSecOps. Um, people use it okay. a, a lot to just say, I work in security and they over there are doing DevOps. <laughs> I'm like, no, you have to work with them. Then you're not doing DevSecOps. You have to work with them. Yeah, exactly. Is it Sec um, DevOps so I... or DevSecOps or? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on who you ask, for sure. Exactly. No, exactly. No, that's that's a good point. I think it does get thrown around a, a lot and probably often is used incorrectly too. So, no, good choice. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you submit to conferences because you know ones you enjoy, ones you you know want to go to because you get a free pass. So. If you could attend any conference in the world, security conference, what would you pick? What's the best one to attend? I love DevSecCon. It's my favorite. And then it's and followed very closely. DevSecCon. And where, where is that hosted? Whereabouts? What's the oh, location? It, is, it moves around the world. Yeah, it moves all mm -hmm. around the world. So it's in London once a year. It's in San Francisco once a year. It's in Seattle once a year. It, it's in Singapore once a year. It's all over the place. It's super fun. Awesome. I also, okay. I also love the OWASP conferences. It's like, it's very close tie. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll let you have to, that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, who's, who's your biggest inspiration in the industry? Um, oh, that's so hard. Um, I would probably say it's my two professional mentors, um, Chen Si Wang and then um, Kim who is more shy, so I won't say her last name, but she founded two giant startups uh, in Canada that have both been like wildly successful. Um, and then Chen Si Wang is the founder of Rain Capital, and then she has funded and started so many companies, it's absolutely like out of this world, and so I admire both of them a lot. Awesome, good stories. Um, 
Okay, if you could tell one person um, to just to do one thing to help improve their personal digital security, what would that one thing be? Turn on multi-factor authentication for every single account you can, and preferably get an authenticator app. But if you can't, you know, getting an SMS is good enough if that's not offered. Yeah, great advice. Uh, you're definitely not the first person to have said that, and you won't be the last. So, good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this is this could be the easiest question for you to answer. Uh, what's the best cybersecurity book? <laughs> I like my book the best. Yes, I know that's really cheesy. Um, I like it because there's stories and pictures, and I made it the most easy to understand that I could. Um, I don't know what second choice I would have right now because I'm currently halfway through so many. Mm -hmm. You could see my library down there. I really like, I enjoyed the tribe of hackers, but of the best books, I don't know. Actually, you know what? The best book I would say would have to be the DevOps handbook. And I know that you might not think it's a security book, but they cover security in depth in the book. And okay. I've read it a few times because I like it so much. So my book, Alice and Bob learn application security available on Amazon, or <laughs> I love the DevOps handbook. It's just so good. Okay, it, it's great choice. <laughs> no, that's a really good choice. Um, okay, and then the last question. Um, this is the one that divides opinion the most. Uh, pineapple on a yes. pizza, is that acceptable? Yes, I always want pineapple on my pizza. <laughs> Pineapple's the best. Great choice. I, I get Great that choice. some people I, don't I, like I it, and they're <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I agree. I 100% agree. And we've asked a few people that, and more people are in favor of pineapple on a pizza than not. So I'm, I'm pleased there's a good, good back into pineapple on pizza. So good choice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> okay, that was the end of the questions. Uh, so I just want to say thank you, Tanya, for you know for joining us today and sharing your insights. Uh, it was really, really great to, to hear some of those stories and different tips and advice. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. You're welcome.